Paul, I come to you from a freshly set up office. Excellent. So you got everything painted, all the furniture just exactly in the right place, all your lighting well, correct. No, not remotely. This, okay, you know, all the paint, you know, we have to take this wallpaper up, paint here, strip the carpet here, and we've been just grinding through that since, basically since last Tuesday. And things were really tight today. Saturday's our day off, but like, you know, at the end of the day, it's time to get ready for the die cast. One hour ago, the room I'm sitting in was absolutely bare. It was just this blank echo chamber with not a stick of furniture in it. And in that hour, the whole family got together and got all my, all my furniture in here and set my computer up on it and got all this crazy audio equipment connected. But it's totally haphazard and hung blankets on the walls because it would literally be just agonizing to listen to I mean, just like one of those rooms that's really harsh and echoey but we sure, hung a bunch yeah. of heavy yeah a bunch of heavy blankets on the walls so the acoustics are it's not very beautiful but you know you can't tell because it's a podcast yeah it sounds pretty good right so i am functioning i am fine just barely like we were just finishing this up when it was time to come in here and i was terrified i'm gonna like sit down and like some crucial piece of equipment wouldn't be plugged in or i wouldn't know where the power adapter was so it all works <laughs> no. like there's a usb cable missing and you don't know where they are and you left them at the old apartment and you don't have any clothes and you're doing a presentation in front of the whole class <laughs> Exactly. That's that's been that's that nightmare has been just the last five days or whatever. Just okay. Here's this device set up. Except we don't have the cord to plug this device into this other de device, and oh, it's so complicated setting everything up. But we are. Um, I guess I'm sort of jumping the gun. You know what? How about you talk for a few minutes, rather than me just eat a huge block of time at the top of the show? Okay. Um, video games, right? I, I played... So last week we talked about... Uh, we got a, a message from Jennifer Snow reminding us that there's a bunch of free content on Lord of the Rings Online and Dungeons and & Dragons Online. And uh, I was like, man, I'm going to take advantage of this. Like, I've got I've to gotta take advantage of this and, you know, see what this is all about. So I signed up for a Lord of the Rings Online account, and then I tried to sign up Ooh. using the same username for a Dungeons and Dragons Online account, but it said that I couldn't use it, which I think means that I, like, you only need one account. I'm not sure how that right. works. I believe that is the case. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure, but I believe that is indeed the case. I haven't installed Dungeons and Dragons Online yet, but I was going to test it out after I gave the. Uh, Lord of the Rings Online a Shakedown, so I booted it up and watched a, a long intro cinematic that's animated and stuff, and um, like it, it has a very mm, late 90s feel to it. It does. It, it, it does. It feels like maybe a blizzard. You know, like blizzard cutscenes right around the time. I mean, higher def. But like the Blizzard style of cutscene in, you know, StarCraft and such. And I think what makes it that way is that those are keyframed, hand done animations instead of mocapped. And that's what makes it look a little old. Not so much the visuals, because mm. there's lots of games with, with low poly, but something about that presentation feels a little stiff to modern audiences. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not bad. It's just kind of it was it was quaint. It was like, oh wow. Like I haven't seen I haven't seen something like this in a long time. Right, right. And it's it's good. The the cutscenes are actually pretty brief. You would think that oh, this is such a story heavy MMO that they pack it with cutscenes, but actually they were fairly restrained. That was probably due to budget. But I appreciated that. I appreciate it. And plus, the move when this game came out, the movies were very much fresh in everybody's mind. And the comparison 
would not be favorable if they really leaned into their cutscenes. <laughs> yeah. So keep that and in the background. They probably couldn't and... license it from the from the movies either, right? Right. So it was fun. I I booted up. I didn't get all the way through uh, through even the tutorial. Like I I haven't devoted enough time to it, but uh, it's it's good. It reminds me of, of World of Warcraft, of course. Like it has a lot of the same feel to it. Um, I haven't got deep enough into the mechanics to know if it's like more or less complicated. I've I've heard that it's more complex, uh, but it it, it had it has some similarities at least. What class or race? More importantly, what race did you roll? Oh, I just I just picked like man. I just I just said go. I didn't even I don't know. Right. I'm a man. I'm a, a, a some sort of stabby man, a, like a bandit or something. I think it's Bandit. interesting. Yeah, the the game has a very interesting, like your, you, you select gender with race, so you can be a man or a woman, a male dwarf or a female dwarf, and it treats each one of those as an individual speed. You don't like pick elf and then it asks which gender do you want to be. You you have to pick both at the same right. time. And all of that is so that they can have dwarf with no gender, because there's so <laughs> content because there's contention among people like, oh no, you know, some people think we just never got to see any dwarven females, and other people, but then there's a throwaway line in there in the movies. I don't remember it from the books. Yeah, in the where, movies. Yeah, where it's like, oh, they look so much alike, you can't tell the difference. And either way, the, you know. The people who made Lotro didn't want to definitively come down on that one way or the other. So they were just like, dwarf. And you can imagine your gender whatever you want. Nice. Right. It's such a charming game. Oh, I If you play more, I am eager to hear more about your thoughts. I, I just love thoughts, especially today. Like, anyone in the comments, if you play Lotro for the first time, I'd love to hear your take on it. It's super old school, very quaint, almost innocent by today's standards of, like, what you expect from an online game. But it's very earnest, and it respects this source material. And I just... I'd love to hear what anybody anybody thinks of the experience. My my intuition says it won't be great because this type of MMO has been out of style for a decade now, but I'm curious. People are still playing WoW, so. Right, the exception, but even WoW has been like you know, WoW today is not WoW from 2004. I mean, like, everything, even the, the, you know, other games will add on additional content, but WoW has been redoing early content, and that's quite different. It's very interesting. True, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't play WoW actively these days, but um, I have friends who, who do, and it's, it's not that much different. I mean, it doesn't look that much different. Maybe it is under the hood, but... It looks kind of the same. It's still hot bar combat with running around to quests and doing stuff. Maybe you have to stay in special places or something. Did you ever see the Folding Ideas video about old school WoW? About, um, what's that called when they brought it back? Um, classic. Classic, thank you. WoW Classic. Um, Folding Ideas did a great video on WoW Classic. I really love it. I think I did see it, but I don't remember it. I will link it in the show notes for anybody who hasn't seen it. It's a lot of fun. We can all watch it together. Right. It, it, makes, it makes the case that the graphics are better, but in some cases, uh, some of the art is lost as it moved away from the handcrafted early stuff to the kind of crank it out theme park later stuff like the the creative priorities changed as the you know team size grew and uh it's very right. interesting the, the the example he uses and it's a really good example 
is in classic WoW when you come into Orgrim Orgrimmar? Or or Orgrimmar? I totally I think forget Orgrimmar how to say is right, that. Yeah. Orgrimmar is originally it was designed you would turn you would go down a long tunnel, turn this corner, and it would create this sort of distinct vista for you to consider. Like this very designed to create this sense of space. Whoa, this tower stark against the sky, this thing over here. And when you go back and when you play the modern game, of course, the town's changed because, you know, of all the events of all these expansion packs. So the, the city is by necessity different. But when you go around that corner, it's no longer designed to give you the, wow, what an amazing view. Now it's just a bunch of clutter in your face. Because mm -hmm. it's much more densely built. And, you know, that was a freedom afforded by, you know, the original one, maybe they had to do that for Polygon reasons because this was running on 2004 computers. But it's still, it's still, I really do think the classic entry leaves a bigger impression. If this was your first time coming into this city, this... The original one was more of a had more of punch to it, and right. I thought that was a yeah. There was a bunch of interesting uh, observations like that in this video. I will link it in the show notes. Whereas at this point, people who've been playing the game probably aren't ever walking through the front doors. They're probably like coming in on a Griffin or whatever they use right. over Ogrimmar. Over and, you know, the, when they enter, when they roll a, an alt and walk into the town, they're not even, like, looking at the sky. They're, they're like, on autopilot, nudging the mouse while they type in chat. Like, <laughs> they don't care. They've seen it a right, thousand right. times. Like, it just doesn't. So, it's not that it's bad. It's just interesting how it changed over time. Not just, like, oh, they added more polygons, but, like, really artistically changed. And the creative yeah. sensibilities changed. So what games have you been playing this week? I've been playing move everything I own to a new house. And I gotta say, oh, I yeah. hate it. It's, <laughs> it's the most expensive game I've played all year. It's incredibly painful to play. Um, and it's really long. And it doesn't respect your time. Like, you can't pause it. If you need to go do something uh, so it's I guess kind of like an MMO except there's nobody to help you and you have to do everything alone so yeah terrible game six and a half I've out been... of ten <laughs> the worst ended the worst game ever six and a quarter oh <laughs> yeah uh, actually, I mean, I complain a lot, and it really was a rough week on my almost 50-year-old body. I was really feeling it um, on Friday. Um, but I love this house. It's so wonderful. Like, even, even if the house itself wasn't massively more comfortable and beautiful and had a lovely view... We've moved off one of these main, like, the street we lived on had a lot of um, neighbors shouting at each other on the front porch. The, the houses were very close together. Police show up once about once a month, you know, around midnight to settle some dis domestic dispute bullshit a couple houses down. Um, guys on motorcycles just roaring up and down the hill at ridiculous hours and just oh, no. shattering your eardrums. Like, not just motorcycles, but guys with great big trucks that want everybody to know that they have a great big truck and, you know, feel the need to rev their engines extra hard like it's their mating call or something. And, uh... Just the noise and uh, across the there's a, it's we didn't notice how noisy it was until we left because there's like no trees or there, there's a, occasionally a tree and in fact in go, we'll talk about video game in city skylines you can deaden sound 
by plant by re planting trees along a street. And I thought, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah you put it in a certain kind of street that has trees along the edge and like a sidewalk or whatever. Right. And I was like, okay, that probably has a tiny effect, but that they've exaggerated for it for video game purposes. And having moved from houses, you know, that are, you know, two meters apart and no trees around to houses that are like 15 meters apart and surrounded by trees and, and well manicured shrubs and bushes and flower beds and everything. Wow, the massive, even when somebody does drive by, how much sound all that foliage really does absorb. It's amazing. So, I mean, we only moved a mile and a half, but it feels like another country. Hmm. So much quieter, so much more beautiful, so much safer. It's so good. I'm I'm really glad for you guys. I'm sure everyone in the show is really glad for you guys too. It's that's that's Thank a really you. great thing. Yeah. It was hard move, but it's 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 worth it. Of course it's worth it. Mm. Uh, we've got We've got more work coming up. I mean, there's lots of... One of the reasons we were able to get a house this nice, even though we... This house had the perfect things wrong with it. You know, <laughs> things that are annoying but not expensive to fix. Things that nobody wants to bother with but not uh -huh. expensive to fix. So if, you know, if somebody who really knew what they were... This would have been a great house for a house flipper. You could come in here and replace the really dated like wallpaper and, and stuff and and carpeting and, and some of the, you know, decoration decisions that have been made in the last 50 years to this place. Replace those and it would instantly look way more modern and be worth way more money. So it it was totally usable, totally livable, and had these few annoying decorations and problems and old stuff. You know, like uh, the the wall outlets are only two prongs. Yeah, so, that's kind of tricky to fix though, isn't it? No, because the wiring, the electrician came in and he was like, you've got a ground wire. The wiring is there. It's just they left the original outlets in. So people oh. come through. They look at the house and they go, oh, I don't want to live here. Look at how ancient the wiring is. But no, brand new service panel, brand new wiring, and ancient plugs on the wall. It's like they disguised <laughs> the house as something as being a much... So we just replaced that and suddenly, oh, wow, it's it's got a modern system. So you see what I mean by it? it's like it had just the right things wrong with it. Just, it sort of like drove other people away so that we could get in here. Sweet. It's very nice. Very happy. So, how's your luck going, Paul? How's that job search situation? Well, I applied to a bunch of places and uh, I got a few responses back. No thanks. No, we're not hiring, actually, or whatever. Um, not a good fit. Most of them are, you know, like, thanks for submitting your resume. You're not a good fit. And that's just kind of par for the course when you, you go to job searching. I don't know. When was the last time you went looking for a job, Seamus? I honestly can't remember. I don't think I've had a... I didn't have a resume. I got uh, into active... Right? Like, the last time I made a proper resume and sent it out to places was probably 94. I was 10 years old. <laughs> like, people were like, oh, you time to update your resume. I'm like, my resume probably died on a th Windows 3.1 floppy somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so it's been a long time. You haven't... So, like, par for the course, I, I did this whole song and dance about uh, 14 months ago. Uh, I was on the job search for unrelated reasons but uh and yeah it send out your resume to a thousand places and you get like a hundred responses back saying no thanks and then you get maybe 10 
where they ask you to come in and do an interview. And then uh, in that case, it was someone, it was somewhere where I had not applied at all. Like I had applied somewhere like a year before then. And they just called me out of the blue and they're like, hey, we've still got your resume on hand. Are, are you looking for a job? And I'm like, yes, actually I am. <laughs> so it was this weird thing where like I worked and worked and worked and worked to try to get, you know, applications out and go to interviews and stuff. And then where I actually got hired was just like, it was unrelated. That's amazing. Good timing, though. Yeah, I was I was happy how it turned out. Um, but it it kind of makes it the all that work seem futile right so like so this time i'm like well here we go again i'm just gonna start applying to places like that's what you do like what else are you gonna do sit around and wait for somebody to just like call you up and uh so i've applied to places and and uh, had a couple interviews and you know it wasn't a good fit and that's fine it's that's normal usually it takes months and months to to get somewhere but um a couple days ago i got a call from someone out of the blue hadn't applied there it was a company i'd worked for before the owner saw that my my LinkedIn thing had updated to had uh, been laid off, and he's like, "Hey, we've got some openings. Are you interested?" And I was like, I said, "Sure." So I'm going to interview on Monday, and we'll see how it turns out. But it it seems like that may be uh, that may be a, a fit at least for the time being. Cool. Good luck. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean I I stopped working there before because it was. Um, boring and <laughs> not oh. not interesting work you know but uh right. if it pays the bills it's uh it's a good timing especially right now when everything's so crazy it'd be good to to at least be bringing something in right uh boredom is preferable to the excitement of poverty <laughs> yeah yeah seriously all right. Um, uh, let's do some mailbag questions. Yay! I didn't read any of the. Neither of us read these questions. Normally, we kind of read them and parse out the question and cut cut them down. Nope, we just came in cold today, so this might be a little scatter shot. Dear Diecast, Hi, it may be an odd time to ask this question and an odd question at that, but I recently thought about it, Paul. What was the main reason you were hired to work on the Shadow of the Conqueror film? Did it have anything to do with your scathing yet interesting long-form critique of the book? No offense, but I find it kind of weird that you were hired to work on a property you've publicly been publicly critical of. What does the rest of the team think about it? Keep being awesome, Lino. And then Lino wishes us luck in our in our endeavors. Thank you, Lino. I don't know why they wanted me on the team. <laughs> it was it was one of those things where I was like when I when I applied, I sent a link to the the article. I was like, "Hey, you're looking for somebody who's uh, got some skills and who's familiar with the work. I am familiar with the work as evidence. Here's my like short story novel uh critique of everything that I found that didn't make any sense. And uh, so then they called me back and they're like, hey, yeah, I, uh, you know, we looked at your portfolio and stuff. And uh, basically they, they wanted me on board for 3D modeling and, and like uh, CG and stuff. And uh, they didn't have anyone in their team that was like dedicated to that. And I was one of the first people who, who sent in an application and they were happy with the quality of the stuff that I could do. And so they're like, sure, come on board. And uh, I, I asked them, like, hey, what, did you did you read the review? And they're like, yeah, we read it. Um, it's clear that you're familiar with the material. If you're willing to, <laughs> to work on the project, <laughs> if you're if you're willing to work on the project, then, you know, clearly you are you're capable of, of setting those those ob, ob, uh, what is it? Objections aside. And, you know, if you can work together with us. Great. And I was like, OK, yeah. And I and that's kind of where I'm I'm at, too, is like they're not going into this with a like the book is the best thing ever they're like the book was really fun to read and it was interesting and i agree with that like it is really interesting and, it's, and it was fun to read and uh we, and they want to make it into a great movie and that will mean that some things from the book don't stay and and they're going to try to stay as close as possible but you know they're going to try to make it look good and um 
And like, I'm on board with that. And I'm, I'm not trying to make it totally make sense. Cause in my review, I was like, Hey, here's all the things that don't make sense. But like, you know, it's, that's okay. It doesn't have to make sense. And, uh, in the, in the short film, they're, they're trying to make it look good. They're trying to make a good movie. They're not trying to make it like a documentary of like how exactly all this works. And so if things don't make sense in the movie, that's fine. You know, it's, it's okay. So, uh, yeah. So they did read it and, and they know that I was, uh, very critical of some parts of it. And, uh, but we're not trying to make it perfect. We're trying to make a movie. So that's, uh, that's where we're at. Very cool. You know, I, I have a, a similar story. Not that, not that happened to me, but it happened in the last year. There's a YouTube channel I watch sometimes called Tanta Cruel. And he mostly does, he's a composer, like a, a classic, you know, write, write music on paper kind of composer. I don't know what those are called. I only understand music when you can put it on a grid and it, and you make it as if you're a robot with no creativity. <laughs> That's my speed. But he's like an actual, he's a real musician and composer. Okay. But his side hustle is that he's really, really into interface design. And I am too. So, and he does these over the top critiques of interfaces, like user interfaces, like why is this option on this menu that makes no damn sense kind of things. And right, what's the, right. What's the most likely thing that a user is going to try to do right here? Yep, that's what they're going to try to do. But the program doesn't seem to think so. <laughs> it's going to do this other <laughs> thing. Um, he did an entire view video savaging the the musical uh, scoring program called Muse Score. And then later the developers reached out to him and he's joined the team to help to design the interface. Hey, there you go. And, you know, it seems like a win all around. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think the difference, I, I don't know about, about Tanticruel, but it seems like, uh, in both his case and mine, the difference is that it's not, you're not, critiquing something because you want to hurt people or, or because you want to like be the victor you're critiquing it because you care about quality and excellence and you think that things could be improved and uh and that that's the there's a huge difference between like mocking something in order to to get attention and critiquing something in order to improve it right Right, it's true. I mean, that's kind of... I mean, I don't expect Bioware to call me up anytime soon, but that was very much the spirit of my Mass Effect series. It's like, well, what went wrong here? And it wasn't because I wanted right. to hurt people or, or because I was doing, you know, savage performance art. You know, savage cruelty and insults as performance art. It's just because, hey, I don't think this piece of art works. And let's break down why. And I like that. I like I enjoy seeing other people do it. So yeah, that's cool. I'll have to look up Tantacruel. That sounds interesting. Interface is, is fascinating because it's like it's almost the quintessential element of programming. Like right. you can get the computer to do math all day long, but like get the computer to do the math that the person wants them wants the computer to do and then present it to the way and the person the way that the person can understand it is like that all of that is interface and so much of programming is like getting the information into and out of the computer right and it is very much communicating with the user and the double-edged sword of that is people that are great i mean this is the stereotype but i believe it exists for a reason people that are very very good programmers tend to have trouble intuiting what other people are thinking they don't understand the way other people think. And it's not because they're dumb. That's just their brains wired a little bit differently than everybody else. Makes them great at programming, bad at, bad at communicating. The, the classic um, example is the programmer that does an excellent job, but when you ask him to explain what he did, he uses a bunch of jargon that only he understands, right? 
Right. He doesn't know. Right. He's doing he a does... he's doing a memory dump. He's not actually instructing. Right. He doesn't know how to. He isn't able to literally translate this complex technical to intuit your skill level to understand what level of complexity the answer needs to come at, and then to translate the incredibly complex job he just did into the soundbite-driven answer you're looking for. Like, that's really hard for programmers, because it involves throwing away an awful lot of information. <laughs> and and uh, a certain degree of, you could even say creative liberties when you're explaining something. You know, you need to reach for metaphors and things like that. And programmers yeah, are not, yeah. are stereotypically, programmers are not great. There's exceptions all over the place, but that's the... So you wind up with a lot of well-written programs with horrendous interfaces, or <laughs> things with beautiful interfaces that just, like, don't work right, or don't make sense, or do a bad job, or use tons of mem you know, just aren't well-engineered under the hood. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it seems like it's because the way that you explain to someone is the opposite of the way that you get the computer to do what you yeah. want. Like, computers don't understand metaphors. Computers don't want you to simplify it for them. Like, if you throw away all those details, the program won't run. <laughs> you've got to you've <laughs> got to maintain all of that. And so, like, right. it's a it's a very like you said, it's a very different skill set. Right. It's almost the opposite. And you. They want to hand you a simple description of what they want done, and you need to figure out the complex instructions to do it. But explaining it to another person after you've done it involves the opposite operation. And yeah, that's really hard for some people. I have always secretly liked to think that I'm good at it, but I'm not really the right person to judge it, you know? It, you'd have to ask my coworkers. Because that's right. the real well, I think that's the real I think judge. that there could be a leave a leave a comment below, folks, if you think that Seamus is good at explaining complicated things in a way that people understand. Because I think I think that there's a, a case to be made. All right, I'll let other people make it. Dear Diecast, I mainly game on PS4, but occasionally I put my underpowered laptop through hell to run some games right on the edge of playability. I think the worst I've ever tolerated was pushing through Scanner Sombra, which the F FPS would often dip into the 15s. So, diecast members, what's the lowest you've ever sank to play something you otherwise probably shouldn't have, or have you never had the pleasure of being a low-spec gamer? Thank you, Caden. Every time Caden... Thank you, Caden. Every time Caden writes us, I confuse with the Caden from Mass Effect. And I just want to say, Caden, I need you to go hug the bomb while I fly off with Ashley. <laughs> All right. I, I was a super low spec gamer back in the 90s. My equipment was trash. I played through Doom at 15 frames a second. And then I played a few years later maybe it was just a year later, on the same hardware, System Shock, which is, you know, people have heard me gush about this game. My first trip through System Shock, my hard, my FPS rarely went above 10 and was often in the 5 range. Yikes. And I played through the whole game like that. And, uh, yeah. Is the simulation tied to the frame rate in System Shock? Um, well, there wasn't much simulation. Uh, and at five frames a second, it's really hard to tell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I came back to it later and it looked smoother, but it didn't seem to, like, operate differently. So, okay. uh, then again, I, for an early 90s game, it would make a lot of sense that a lot of the processing was was tied to the frame rate. That's how everybody did it back then. It just seems like it would make it easier if it was running at a low frame rate that way. Uh, you know what? That might be true. 
That that might be true. It was not as gratifying. I remember years later, you know, a couple upgrades later, I came back to the original System Shock and was like, wow. Oh, this is what it was supposed to feel like? Um, you could actually, I could get the, the frame rate up a bit. Um, the original System Shock had this janky as hell interface where you could basically make your HUD 90% of the screen and your view would just be this little, this little mini, I mean, you're already running a 320 by 200 and now you imagine your actual view is like half of that in the middle of the screen and the rest is just <sighs> interface around that. And I could get a good frame rate, but I wanted to do the other way and get rid of all the HUD and play it, you know, no HUD mode, full screen. And I did that for a lot of the game and it's very hard and not recommended, but I don't know, I was really into that game. And I hadn't, you know, I never tasted 60 frames a second. I didn't know what I was missing. It was just like, oh, I guess this is what 3D games are like. You were playing on a color TV that only went up to 24 refreshes a second anyway. <laughs> well, basically, I mean, I was playing on a on a CRT. It was a it was a computer monitor, but not much. I mean, in those days, they were barely better than televisions. A little bit less fuzz around the edges of the pixels, and that's it. Hmm. So what about you, Paul? I remember the Have first... You... Oh, I, I was going to go off on a CRT tangent. First no, flat no, go ahead. screen yeah, CRT that we had. Go ahead, tell me about your first flat screen CRT. Oh, it was just, it was, it was before there were, there were flat panel, you know, LCDs around. And so, uh, I think dad got it. He had, he had one for work or something and then he got a new one. And so we inherited the, the old one and it's just like, wow, you can see the corners of the screen are like all lined up and they're not all curved away. And like, what is this like the future? Just imagine there isn't like this four cubic feet of, of box behind it. And it could be like from Star Trek. <laughs> right. So and do you have any... those things every once in a while? You'd have oh, to like push the degauss right. button to get it to. And if you had two sitting next to each other, then they'd like interfere. The magnetic fields would interfere. And so it cause problems. I remember I used to listen to the radio because this was before MP3s. Is it in the nineties? I wanted to listen to the radio and I w so I wanted the radio near the computer, but of course the CRT would just generate this horrendous whine <laughs> just from the interference, and you could hear it. Like as I was typing and the contents of the screen changed, you could hear the the sort of timbre of the whine would fluctuate. Like looking <laughs> yes. at a page, looking at an empty page is different than looking at a page full of text. It was just horrible, and I kept doing it. Like. Our standards were terrible back then. <laughs> well, you know, what if you suddenly went blind? You you wouldn't know if the screen was working properly. <laughs> right? <laughs> Just, okay, I'm going to listen to my music with this horrible screeching whine going on in the background. It was just terrible. Oh, wow. Would not have passed the FAA approval these days. No. Or whatever it is, FCC. Anyway, I uh, I didn't really play twitchy games back when I didn't have good hardware. And so I've never had to deal with low FPSs. It was always like turn-based civilization and uh, worms and stuff like that. So uh, we never really had to deal with that. I guess the way back I played some Commander Keen. Uh, but even then, Commander Keen was, was low enough performance requirements that it wasn't a problem. Um, I think I've talked before about Striker, where it was at, like, I forget what computer we were playing that on, but it was a really, really old piece of hardware. And you'd load in the five and a half inch floppy, right? And like, 
and then boot right. up the computer and it would like boot straight into the game or something crazy or I forget some you know some crazy kind of thing you do back in the early 90s and uh and so we play the game and then it but that was tied completely to the clock cycle like it wasn't even frame rate dependent it was like processing clock cycle dependent and so when we got a new computer we're like oh we're gonna get the floppy and of course like that one didn't have a five and a half inch so we had to like transfer the game over to a three and a quarter and then we'd put it in the drive and then you boot it up and this new computer was so much faster that we couldn't play the game anymore because it's running too fast and so <laughs> so then like dad messed around in the bios to like to reduce the clock cycle on the cpu or something crazy and and then like when we wanted to do something else then he had to like come back and like speed it up again so that it was it was faster it was just goofy so i think that was most of the the fps problems i've had uh by the time i got into college and and stuff we were um my friends and i built our own computers and so we never really had too much trouble getting enough processing power to run the stuff that we wanted I remember I came to XCOM late. The game was like 10 years old when I got around to playing it. And it's a turn-based game where you move your guys and shoot at the enemy, and then the enemy, the AI, takes its turn and moves its guys around. And during that space, if it's moving around and you can't see it, you just see a black screen and it's like, you know, enemy movement. And for me, I've never known that to be anything more than a blip like you hit all right computer you take your turn and it's just boom over in a second and you're you're taking your next turn the only time you'll see anything is if the enemy you know takes a shot at you and they come into view of right. one of your characters then then it would slow down very slightly so that you would see whatever they were doing but you know just blink and you'll miss it but apparently back in the day that was really long like when the game was brand new, um, people would t have told me stories about sitting there for a minute or so waiting for this. And that's a nail biting thing. Just staring at the black screen, wondering what's going to happen to your team. <laughs> <laughs> but also yeah. really flow, flow breaking and joy killing just to have those here. So, I mean, that game is notoriously time consuming. Like, you can lose a couple of weeks to uh, a playthrough of XCOM easily. And then to think, wow, on those old computers, that would have been grossly inflated by these epic, you know, waiting time. Not load times, but just the computers actively thinking. <laughs> it's not waiting to pull these off the disk. It's just making calculations, and it takes so long. Hmm. Amazing. There's a guy in college who was playing XCOM during finals week, and he, he skipped all his finals. Yeah, yeah, not not a good plan. Of course, like he was getting all his his college was being paid for by his parents, his rich parents or whatever, and so he's like, if I flunk out, I just get to stay another year. I'm like, okay, buddy, you you do that. That is. You know, I can see both sides of that. As a parent, I'd be livid. But, you know, based on my memories of high school, well, I guess that's the difference. You're paying for college. Back in high school, you know, a lot of stuff I didn't care about. And I only did enough to get out of there. So I can I can sympathize with that. Like, I've got better things to do than to put up with this crap. So I, yeah. I can kind of feel them, but it's a video game, and your parents are paying for it, and you really should go to those finals. Yeah, just show up, man. Just show up and mark everything D. Right! At least do that. At least you can just dash back and play more XCOM, man. Just put in the effort, because, like, what are you going to tell them when you, when, you, when you get absolute zeros on your finals? What are you even going to say? <sighs> Yeah, I don't know. Poor life decisions. Right. Dear Diecast, Hi, I hope you're doing well. I've got a question about tabletop RPGs, which unfortunately is mostly aimed at Seamus. Sorry, Paul. 
I've tried playing RPGs myself, but it turns out that playing them just isn't for me. However, I love talking about um, tabletop RPG design, as well as reading about tabletop RPG campaigns. But no matter how many I read, the one about Mar Tesaro is the best one I've ever come across. I still read it from time to time. Well, thank you. Now, Seamus, you've described the obstacles you have with running a TT game nowadays. However, have you considered running an online game with your friends? Nowadays, there are a little t literal ton of resources geared towards it, from sites like Roll20 and Tabletop Finder all the way to world-building resources like World Anvil. I realize this question is kind of personal, so I won't mind if you choose not to answer. I just thought it was a natural workaround to your burning hatred for all things small, cute, and furry. Keep being awesome. Lino. Yeah, so I often fantasize about how great it would be to run a tabletop game. But I don't know. Would I enjoy it over the internet? I'm not even sure what's possible now. I toy with these ideas now and again. But I can tell, like, I already have more projects. than I'm, I'm already neglecting the guitar. I really want to learn to play guitar. And I don't have enough time for it. And I get a couple extra hours in a week and I'll play some guitar. But then, you know, that doesn't happen for another week or so. So I have no idea where I would ever get the time to play a tabletop role-playing game. Because that's, that's time-consuming. That's really time-consuming. If you want to get do that justice, you need at least a few hours a week. And I don't know where they'd come from. But it's something I would love to do. If I magically had an extra few hours a week that's that is something i would aspire to do to spend those hours on it is very cool and it it sort of it sort of feeds my itch when it comes to you know world building i love that yeah it is very similar to writing where you're trying to right. create a convincing narrative uh but even it's it's harder and it's easier too, right? Because it's it's more difficult because you have to contend with people outside yourself deciding what direction the story's going. But it's also easier Stupid. because you don't have to draw on your own resources in order to come up with inventive things to happen. Yeah, it's pretty much ruined by players and their stupid demands for autonomy. It's really a pain in the ass. <laughs> oh, what you guys? What you know? You guys want to have input? Come on. I already wrote the story. Just sit back and listen to me talk. I'll, don't worry. Ten minutes, I'm going to let you roll some dice. I'm going to have you kill this goblin. Until then, just shut your yap. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. I was joking. Nobody to take that <laughs> advice. Okay, go ahead and do that, but don't tell anybody I told you to do it. Oh dear. I've run a few uh, campaigns myself, not to butt in on your your answer, but um, there's a there's one in particular that I was pretty happy about, and I wrote a blog post about it, and, and which I will put a link in so that people can nice. distract themselves if they'd like. Cool. But also, I do not have time for it anymore. There's just there's just not enough time. Because it's yeah. involved. It really is. Dear DieCast, Lately I've been playing a lot of Egypt's Old Kingdom, a strategy game set in ancient Egypt which prides itself on its historical accuracy and its educational qualities. The end game is based on a period of history called the Bronze Age Collapse, during which a mysterious group known as the Sea People repeatedly attacked Egypt. The historical Sea People temporarily conquered northern Egypt, in the game, the Sea People are an endless series of increasingly large armies who will keep on coming until every single Egyptian everywhere is dead. My question is this. Did the game get history wrong by exaggerating the danger posed by the Sea People? Or did it get history right by giving me the same sort of visceral deep-seated fear of the Sea People that at least some of the ancient Egyptians must have felt? What would you say it means for a game to get history right? John. So, funny thing about this email, somehow this email came a month ago.
And I don't know what happened or if I filed it in the wrong place, but it never got moved to the show notes. So this thing is a month old. And we're just getting, to, and there were other months or there were other weeks in between now and then where I was like, man, I wish we had more mailbag questions. And this was apparently sitting somewhere in my mailbox and I didn't know about it. So sorry for neglecting your question for an entire month, John. I don't know how that happened. I blame Paul. <laughs> um, yeah, I. I don't know if I would even judge historical accuracy. I mean, that's a really interesting idea. A game that you will inevitably lose. That's more interesting to me than the questions of, of historical accuracy is how do you handle making the player lose? I mean, that was the norm back in the coin-operated days. You know, you just... Put a coin in and played Space Invaders until you died. And then you put in another coin. But since then, you know, since you paid for the game and then played it as much as you want, we switched to a system where you're... <laughs> we had a, we began with a system where you will inevitably lose. And then we transitioned to a system where you will inevitably win. And... So going back to that old school design is very interesting and I would think very risky. I I don't know. I mean as long as the player is aware of the historical like of what was supposed to happen in history then I think it's interesting to let them play around with it. Like uh, Civil War, War Gamers, where they obsess over, you know, such and such a battle and such and such a field. And all of this side got, you know, were to cross the valley th three hours earlier. Then it would have changed the whole outcome because, oh no, they wouldn't have been stuck going uphill against superior force. And they would have had this high terrain advantage or whatever those guys are always on about. Yeah, yeah. It's so fascinating um, in that example where they have records, like pretty accurate records of all the the movements of the troops and, and accounts from both sides that have been integrated and, and built into this very accurate diagram of how the battle went. And then they can build a simulation that takes all of that into account and basically like extract rules from that so that if you play the battle the way the battle actually went, the battle will turn out the way the battle actually turned out. Right, and then you can, and then you can play around with the parameters to do other things. But it begins from the starting point of the way things happen in history, and allows you to move away from that. But mm. y you, when you do, you know what the original event looks like. You know you're breaking from historical expectations. Where in a video game, you. You don't know, you know, you don't always know. But I think this thing about the sea why have I never heard of this game? This is such an interesting idea. This idea that the player knows that they're doomed because they know history or the game has explained it to them or something. That's that's really interesting. Hmm. Well in 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 the case of Egypt the Old Kingdom, I I am fairly certain that our records are nowhere near as accurate. Like right. the Bronze Age collapse is kind of a mystery. It's like, why did the Bronze Age collapse happen? It's like very little is known about it, right? It's just like the sea people came and, and also there's a bunch of famines and also there's like people stopped trading with each other. And why? We don't know. So I I think that it's it's a fair thing to do in order to try to get the outcome that actually happened. It seems a little cheap i guess uh to just kind of make it fiat you will lose like in the example of the civil war reenactment stuff like it seems like it would it would be better if there was a, a standard way that it would go if you're decent at the game but there was a possibility of pushing them back or relocating or i don't know you know something doing something different right. to in order to stave off defeat if you knew, if you use your foreknowledge, you could get a different outcome. 
and you could even play it over and over and study it and try and figure out how to win. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thing too. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't condemn any of these ideas as right or wrong. I wouldn't say if the game is getting history wrong as long as the player is aware of what happened in actual history and they know they're playing through a deviation, then, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's all good. Speak, you know, I mean, and at this point, if it wasn't already a dead horse, we could go off on a tangent about the many, many mi missed opportunities of the Assassin's Creed series. But, oh, yeah. Yeah. But what are we, how many sequels are we into now? Like a, a million? Like, I don't even know. <laughs> I have no idea. There's like an they Assassin's. Made, what? Three just on Ezio, right? Right. I think there's, I think there's a, an edition of Assassin's Creed for every year between now and the fall of the Roman Empire. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> really slow uh, so that's another game that uh, that's a game I would say feels historically inaccurate because when they take liberties they don't make it clear when they're taking they take outrageous liberties with historical characters and then plunge back into doing proper history and then weave it together with a bunch of bullshit that makes no sense historically and then go back into here's a famous person that was real and that bugs me that that's a game i could say gets history wrong although i don't know enough about the series to say what parts are wrong just that design style sort of like Ugh, i don't like that but this thing about egypt old kingdom I, I would have trouble saying that that's wrong. Either way you do it, either by making the enemy unbeatable or by allowing you to break from history by beating them. Either one of them seems instructive and a useful way to engage with the material. Hmm. So I think the, the answer we were coming to is that as long as you make a clean break at some point, and from then on proceed in a relatively historical way, then it's you're basically getting history right, whether or not what actually happened is what happens in the game. And the right. problem is where you don't make a clean break and you kind of mix together your fan fiction with real things that really happened and and are kind of railroading it through this this thing that may or may not be accurate and that it's unclear to the player what's actually happening. Yeah. Yeah, I I just like I mean you can't say it's wrong. I mean people make people make games about Star Wars and none of that happened. But I dislike I just dislike mixing. I guess it's it's sort of the anti-educational. It's fine if you know history and you can like go through and like oh here's this leader. Except in this year he would be a ten year old boy and he here he's a grown man leading an army, but. I guess they wanted these two people to meet, so they fussed with the eight. And you can roll your eyes and enjoy the game. But, you know, I worry, you know, some people don't know the material, and they will walk away thinking, this happened. These two guys met on the battlefield, and they never did. Because they were, you know, 40 years apart in age or something. So, yeah, being anti-educational is what bugs me. Well, Paul, I sense that we have done a show. Here we are at the end of the very first diecast in the new building. Right. Well, let's end the show so I can go sleep on the floor in my new living room because <laughs> the paint's still <laughs> the paint's still drying in my new bedroom. <laughs> All right. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. If you have a question you'd like Paul and I to tackle, the email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye.
And when I get up in the morning, I have to figure out what box my coffee maker is in. Oof.